Any other questions before we move on? Sounds good. Uh, when I write it to the plugin authors, I include a proof of concept. That takes me a little bit more time to write, but effectively on many of these things, what we've seen is you gotta dig into the code, I've gotta figure out how to get to that section of code, like that, that line of code. So typically, you, you would target it via like an API. Like I kind of pointed out earlier, I'm like it looks like they, they have this API call, and then, the, um, and then you basically hit that API with the request and it just puts you right in the piece of code you want and then it looks at what was you know the request data which was sent in for me and maybe then the request data is whatever object I want. So maybe proof of concept is just your URL, URL? Yeah, you can do like a proof of concept can be as simple as uh, looking at a URL. If it's a get request with a URL, most of the time they're, they're cookie data or post data. Yeah. So in those cases I use curl uh, or wget. Uh, if you guys are familiar with those programs, those are super elite hacker tools, right? I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be like, here's this whole burp suite. I'm not gonna, I'm not doing the whole like, here's how to do burp intruder, and like, here's how to do scanning software, and do all that stuff. That's not this audience, is it? <laughs> yes? Would a pen test pick up something like this? Oh, so I, at Trustway, that's a good question. Did, would pen test identify and find this? The answer is roughly no. It's not something that's so easily exploitable over the web, and I wrote software at Trustwave uh, that was vulnerability assessment software. I wrote, I wrote vulnerabilities for, uh, for WordPress in it as well. Um, I have credits in Nmap and Metasploit, if you've heard those those tools, uh, and my name is in the in the code, source code, because I wrote the exploits. But the problem is, is that an object, I wouldn't be able to get the response back from the, the browser to see that the object was created. So I wouldn't really know, and it's hard for me to know. That, like, it's really a thing that, that black box testing, which is like testing from the outside without looking at source code, it's not very effective at finding it. Um, you have to pay for more, you have to, for white box testing or code auditing, which is what we're doing right now. And you don't have to pay for it because I just showed you how to do it. Directing lines of code and hoping for the best. All right. Yes, question. Uh, I want to be my writing code. And yeah. It looks all right, no unserialized. You want me to look for you? I can put it up on the big screen. Yeah, I'll, I'll double check for you. You say it's not there, and we'll yes, give your, your so plugin. I'm very surprised, and the, the question is, do I need anything else to make it safe? The plugin name is SpeedGuard. How do you spell it? Uh, SpeedGuard. Oh, SpeedGuard. Is there a dash? No, no, no. Oh, no. it's not in the uh, plugin repo, is it? It isn't plugin repo. Oh, well, it's not in mine, sorry. Uh, I can't do uh, in WordPress. Yeah, is it, is it, well, I can download real, I'll download it in the next example. But that was just for unserialized. There's many other vulnerabilities in the world. Cross-site scripting. This is every security person's first vulnerability. This is, I think everybody has heard of this, right? Yeah, this is probably the, the stuff you've heard of before, unlike unserialized. This is the super popular one. You guys don't know how it works, it's, right? I wanna say, y'all say it with me now, is uh, don't trust user input as the data comes in from the browser and you just output it in onto the, in your HTML response, and now suddenly it's whatever the browser, quote unquote browser, said it was gonna be. And there's any other different ways for that to, to, to interfere. The lucky thing is WordPress does a really good job at preventing these, uh, naturally, and there's a lot of fixes for it. So again, this is my, my mantra, I never trust user input. Uh, you sanitize on input and you escape on output. What that means is when you're accepting data back from the browser, before you store it in the database, before you, you know, you output it again, or before you make use of it in any ways, make sure it was the data you expected it to be. Objects is a very similar problem, right? With the object and serialized injections, you expected an object, you expected a certain type of object. You can now, in PHP 7 and higher, validate that that's the object class that you want it to be. But, again, you know, that breaks backwards compatibility, but with cross-site scripting, again, if you expected somebody's name, Right? It's, it gets complicated and there's a big rabbit hole you can get lost in, but you know, you expect somebody's name, their name isn't gonna be Bobby, you know, oh no, that's an SQL joke. Sorry, it's not gonna be, you know, uh, Bobby, you know, oh, uh, script JavaScript, you know, like script type JavaScript, right? Like nobody's named JavaScript. Um, and that's really the problem. And then of course you have to escape on outputs. Why? It's really because it's better to be safe than sorry. So, and WordPress has a fantastic uh, suite of functions that help you escape on output. The 
this is all the sanitized, oh, this is, sorry, sanitizing and escaping, uh, new sanitized email. So this is for output. Uh, it will validate that the, I think it's for output, the return is a string which looks like a filtered email address because an email address has a RFC, which is, that, which is like an official way that an email address always looks. You just send sanitized email and that validates that the email actually looks like an email address, not HTML, not JavaScript, none of that. And then you can safely echo it, you can output it. It's fantastic and there's a whole bunch of these. You can do it based on your mind type, make sure it looks like a file, make sure it looks like a text or a user. So this is a fantastic uh, series of functions that really help out on sanitization and escaping as well. So you can escape HTML or JavaScript which would be something that maybe you wanted it to be outputted, but you wanted it to look nice, as opposed to actually run JavaScript in the browser. Same deal, there's a big suite of it, and this is what the example, it shows you that the, you know, escape HTML, and outputs that nice, you know, human readable uh, format, but you, you all know what this is, right? Escaped characters, ampersands, less than, right there's less than, which is that, that. So it makes it so the browser can output it correctly, nicely. Um, UK cookie consent. Let's talk about privacy. Everybody knows this uh, cookie consent law came up and unfortunately it's, this was a great plugin that added the features that were needed, but it also added a feature that's not wanted, a vulnerability cross-site scripting attack. So here we go. Let's do some session. What do you guys see here? Where is the vulnerability? In the option value is not yep, right there. That's, I don't know actually where the answer is on these either, but that looks all right. It, it's actually going back to page ID. There you go, you were right. And all they need to do is escape the attribute. That's, that's it. And escape the HTML right here, the post title. That was probably the big one, it was actually post title, same line. So yeah, an ID is probably an ID, a number. But hopefully it was sanitized on input or validated on input as being only a number, not, you know, ID number script JavaScript. You alert one. Yes? Sure, I don't know where it is. It just exists on my laptop right now. Yeah, again, like I explained, like all I did was I looked at, by the way, this is from WordPress Bone database, WP Scan vulnerability database. Um, good people, nice guy. Uh, and he's great to just email if you're like, if you have vulnerabilities, you get it, you get your name up on their website, and that's all you get, you don't really get paid money, you just get fame and glory. Um, and this way, you can go to the site, find the vulnerabilities, your own, and then from that site, you can look in to see where the diffs were, which is, you look for the diffs like this, is what it is, and you'll be able to see what it is and how it works. So he's got one here. <coughs> Actually, I don't even know where this vulnerability is. I think I see what it is, though. Huh. Yeah, that's the problem here, is then this is an odd one, because they're trying to get environment variables, and the trick here is that the server, they're basically probably somewhere else in code. It's a bad example. Probably somewhere else in code, they're calling get IP and then outputting that to the browser. Um, but in this case, they're using server remote address. I probably use this example because I wanted to point out that that server variables are also not to be trusted because that comes from, it can, it can come from a proxy, but it can also sometimes come from host headers, uh, which are just the HT, H, extra HTTP um, data that's being sent along. And here you go, this is what they did as their fix. Oh, they had to filter. That was the problem, is they had to have a whole section where they filter the variable to val make sure it's a valid IP address. And this is, this is uh, filtering. This is because, again, remote adder probably could have been a host name, which doesn't look like an IP address and might look a little bit like, you know, HTML. Uh, so you want to make sure it looks like an IP address. And this is good sanitization for input. All right, let's see this. BBPress. BBPress attachments. This one's probably more. This is probably a better example. Who's found it? I think I see it. It's not so obvious. Nothing. File Probably file name. Yeah, that's what I think that is too. Yeah. So let's see. Let's see. It's right there. Is you didn't escape the HTML output for the error file name 
or the file there, that value, this array right here. I apologize that these aren't like complete vulnerabilities because that confusion, I'm even confused. I'm like, I don't know really what that's getting called or what that was set to. It's not the best initial example, but the, the solution here is good, escape HTML. That's the solution because he expected HTML and we need to escape it when he outputs it back. So again, looking, you're looking for things. We're doing a quick workshop. I think we're going a little bit slow, so I'll do a little quicker on the workshops. Uh, we're looking for print and echoes, and, uh, and, uh, and the input includes things like a post or get value. And I'll just try to do a live one. Actually, I'm going to download your plugin and see what's going on. Sorry, I'm going to quickly. I'm not online, I don't think. What was the uh, plugin name? Speedy? Speed guard. Speed dash guard? Without a dish. Okay. Guard. <coughs> right? Is that right? Well, I don't have internet, so. Almost. Almost. No, it's okay. This is my, my phone. It would be very slow. Actually, I'm not going to be able to download it, it looks like. But If this works, finds anything. Oh, that's not good. A lot of people output it, it looks, they just echo directly. What's funny about this, so quick story and then I'll move on to the next one. So a lot of people obviously use echo and then use a value, uh, capital, just a capital is not what I want. I want to say something that really looks like a poster get. That should work. Do you think the dollar sign is going to be a special character? So I might have just be breaking my show right now. Do you think that's just gonna work out? Oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. Much better. Yeah, yeah that's not good. <laughs> that one right there. Right? Who sees the problem with that? It's probably gonna be a problem. Now there's a story with this word. <coughs> Am I still losing time? We got like half an hour left. Yeah. Um, the story where, uh, who here has heard of DEF CON? Information Security Conference happens once a year. Somebody, me being interested in security and WordPress, and I see this talk that they're going to give, and the talk was uh, hacking all the WordPress plugins. So I'm like, all right, what do you got? Like, let's see what you did. The guy was looking for cross-site scripting, specifically cross-site scripting, and he saw what I just is scrolling across the screen right now. A lot of apparent cross-site scripting. Uh, luckily, there's actually WordPress core does send us some basic sanitization on inputs. So actually most cross-site scripting, which any other, any other code base, this would be a huge problem because this would be cross-site scripting everywhere. Uh, WordPress core does proper sanitization automatically for you and it actually will escape things correctly just, just a little bit, but it suggests enough that this guy who thinks, who basically said he found hundreds of thousands of vulnerabilities and was super happy, he found zero <laughs> in the end. All right. I'm gonna let that just go in the background and pick this up. And, uh, any other questions about cross-site scripting? It's the idea that, again, never trust user input. The browser will output that, and if it's HTML on the screen, it looks bad. It's, we can start executing JavaScript, we can start inputting whatever data we want on it. I found a vulnerability once in Cisco uh, product, like their web page, and it was very fun because I put up a, a, a animated GIF on their website. 
So that was my proof of concept was a little cat gif. And I'm like, you're vulnerable, now your site has cats on it. Well, it, it, it can be your, as long as it's your site. <laughs> Don't test things on other people's sites like I do. <laughs> like I tested that in, with Cisco's actual website, but that was because that's the only code base it is. WordPress is open source, you can do it on, it, cross site scripting is not very dangerous. It's not gonna break a website, probably not gonna break a website. Uh, it can do some interesting things if it's stored in the database, because then every time you visit the page, it'll keep popping up JavaScript, your, your validation. But yeah, do it on your own site, on a VM, do it on a test server. Uh, serialize is a bit more dangerous, and SQL injection is definitely more dangerous. Do not try to, don't test SQL injection on people. It'll drop your database. It can drop your database. Whole thing. That's the joke, um, is it Bobby Drop Tables. Who, who here knows the Bobby Drop Tables joke? XKCD, it's a good art, or it's a good comic. The, the joke is that the parents named their kid Bobby Drop Tables and we put a little escaped uh, SQL statement in there, which is SQL injection. So the school, when they send him to school and they put their son's name in the, in the database, it dropped the whole school database. <laughs> yeah. Because, remember what I said? Never trust user input. Um, SQL, you can do, so the correction, so SQL injection basically is what I just explained, the, the very similar to cross-site scripting. But instead of outputting to the browser, it's your SQL query starts getting, uh, has a little, end to the query, so your query starts with like select star from table, and then where, uh, then the conditional, that's the, brow that's the data you got from the browser, maybe it's a user ID, right? User ID equals blah. And that was the get request ID, you know, get ID value. And you expected it to be a member, so again, but it doesn't have to be a member because it came from the browser, so you're, that, you can change that statement to select star from table where user ID is zero and also drop all the tables like afterwards or, or update all the tables or, or change, you can just extend the, the SQL query to do something very malicious on top of what it tried to do. Um, w WordPress, luckily again, this is the second most popular vulnerability out there in the world. WordPress has a great functionality to prevent this and it's WordPress DB Prepare. It lets you do prepared statements which are a way to basically validate that an ID looks like an ID. I didn't, okay, well, we'll go a little faster because this doesn't have the example. This is you know, term ID, it's funny, I guess that. Uh, how prepared statement works, right? It changes from this to this. That's, this is the problem. Select count, blah, 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 just what it, where I said where term ID is ID, and ID was just pulled from the browser. Oh, ID was set there, request or ag ID. That's a problem. So the browser sets this value here, and they just set it there, and if it's gonna be an attack or a malicious one, the ID value of ID is you know, they only thought it would be a number, but really I can just keep adding to that whatever select, well, whatever SQL query I want and then do something malicious. The fix is using what WPBDB prepare. Prepared statement works a lot like sprintf if you guys are C coders or C++ coders. Same, same thing, you set the type right here, we're doing this little, uh, what is that called, percent sign, and saying that's a digit, I'm expecting this to be a digit, and then you, you pass in the argument of what you want to put in place of that, of that uh, I don't know what that, that placeholder is. But yeah, basically, it says it's gonna be a digit, here's an ID, and if it's not a digit, it makes it a digit, and it makes it safe, at least, and it, the SQL query won't work, but at least it won't, won't start ex executing extra commands directly the, um, to the database server. You can also use uh, escape, or in this case, they tried to use escape SQL, and unfortunately, that's not what you wanna do. Uh, it, it escapes it, but it doesn't, uh, um, it doesn't validate what it is. So the fix here on this piece of code was to do a int val, which literally just changes, forces it. Much like what that prepared statement does, it forces whatever it is to be integer value. It doesn't allow it to be a string or any other unexpected data. So who here sees the problem? Yep, it's probably exactly where it is. They, and they also didn't use prepared statement. So, oh, this is my word of warning one. This is what happens to your plugins when you don't fix, when you don't patch your code. The unfortunate, well, it's great that the plugin security team, or the plugin team, it will do this, but it also means that many plugins who have been abandoned or lost to time and atrophy and, you know, maybe you've moved on, if the plugin team gets a report of a vulnerability and you're not responsive or reporting back on it, they just shut it down. So the plugin is now gone. Yes? In this case, can somebody else take over and make 
Yeah, you can put if uh, yes, the adopt me tag. You can talk if you have an old plugin and you're like, I really don't want to update it anymore. Put it up for adoption. Let somebody else take control. Figure out. The plugin team. They'll help you out. If you just want to take over the plugin? No, no, no. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there is nothing to say. Like, for example, uh, there is a plugin that converts if you type uh, the title in Cyrillic, it uh, converts the yeah. URL. Yeah. Uh, it converts the URL into the like mm -hmm. characters instead of the Cyrillic. You can't have updated in like, I don't know, two years maybe. I'm going to talk about that. There's a very, I mean, I don't work with the plugin team. So I'm just on my own. I, I get along better on my own. Um, I know what you're, I know what you mean, so it's basically the concern is like, what if the plugin's not working right, anything like that. Really the answer, I think what their answer is going to be for the plugin team, and I'm not speaking for them, but the, I think it is basically, why don't you write your own plugin that does that right? You can, you should be able to, all of the plugins should be open sourced, so you can branch off of it and say, well, I'm doing this because the other guy wasn't updating. And if the plugin team doesn't want duplicate plugins, which I think they don't, that's not a nice thing to do, but you can ask when you also talk to them and say, you know what, like, this person's not communicating this plugin author, like, I want to fix this thing in it, and I want to make it, and then you can probably work with the plugin team to, to get you access to that plugin. And I'm going to get into why that's kind of a problem. Uh, but I'm kind of short on time, so securing the endpoints, uh, and by endpoints I mean, like, the best API and the Ajax API, um, you need to always remember to call this current user can. That validates the permissions, or I think um, WordPress has a different word for it, which the talk for that is happening right now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that basically allow, validates that the user, the action that's happening, the user who's logged in can actually do that action. So let's say you made an a, a REST API endpoint to say, actually, you know, I probably have examples. Uh, yeah, all I do is make sure you call current user can. You can also use the nonces, and there's a great resource for that, which is all the plugin security team. Oh, my tab got suspended, and I don't have internet now. Anyways, this plugin handbook, and I have a link in the last slide to this, I have a URL for it. Um, this is super valuable for plugin authors. You can look to see how it works, and they talk about exactly how, uh, how you can secure input, secure output, do data validation. I could have basically just read those, those slides, and it would have been very good for everybody, but I wanted to show people all vulnerabilities. Uh, but anyways, the REST API endpoint, let's say you have a callback function here, and the first thing you need to do always is say, current user can. Can this user do this? Can this user edit other posts? Or for Ajax, you have no priv and priv uh, actions, where priv will validate that the person is logged in, but it only validates that they're logged in, not do they have a permission. So you still need to validate by saying, current user can. And that's one function call, and then it will secure your endpoint. Because imagine you had an endpoint that you want it to be able to update blog posts real quick. So you create a quick REST API endpoint that you can ping it, and then you can update the blog post with, I don't know, maybe a timestamp or some trivial thing. And you thought, oh, well, how trivial. But the problem couldn't come in where now, if you forgot to run current user can, your endpoint now lets anybody do that thing. This is also how the POCs start. This is, this is the section where I could actually get into writing POCs, because then that's how I can get into pieces of code, like a certain section of code. To, to have it execute the serialized or the HTML outputs. Um, and don't secure your endpoints the Tim Thumb way. Who remembers Tim Thumb? You know, Tim Thumb was a theme, or actually like a library for themes, where they conveniently created their own section, a little bit of code, because they needed a way to independently handle file uploads. They didn't use the WordPress core version. They just wrote in their own, and they added this fun, this, this uh, PHP file to handle all their uploads. They created an endpoint for a purpose, but there's no security in it at all. The, this resulted in it was a vulnerability where anybody in the world could upload files to any WordPress site that had Tim's on itself. So do, who sees the problem with that? And this was horrible because on top of it, it was a partial of a theme, it was a premium theme, so there's no way for them to push updates on top of that. So people who had the theme, who had paid for the themes, had this, this insecure uh, library, Tim Thumb, and uh, they were able to just upload, what, people were just uploading people's sites everywhere. It was a very bad day. That was when I was at a uh, DreamPost. 
here's an example here, current user can, that literally all you need to do is, uh, is add the current user can, that's all. Same thing, current user can, if not user can, current user can edit posts, return false, which basically says if they can't edit the post, just exit the code. And this is the important thing too, remember too to exit your code when, when you've encountered a negative thing. This, is, this was a fix as well for an endpoint. They forgot to, to uh, return false would have been here too. Die kills the PHP process entirely. But the, the problem here was obviously, they did all this checking, and, but the problem was is that if you could not verify your nonce or uh, that was, yeah, they were using nonsense for validation here, but they couldn't verify the nonce, it just it echoed this error, but they never stopped the code, so the code would keep running. So that doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't work right, because then you can just keep running whatever code. You're, the, when you print an error, make sure you exit code, return, or die, or end it. Um, I don't really have a lot of time for securing endpoints like workshop here, but I think hopefully if you look at that idea, it's a really basic idea, is that, because then it's, then it's a harder one to do, because I can't say to what to look for. You have, to look, you have to be familiar with your plugin and understand what endpoints, what API and AJAX calls you created, and then make sure you're doing them clean. So if there's an error, you make sure you escape or end, or you know, close the code, and if there's a uh, uh, validation for the user, can, a user can actually take that action, if, it's a, if it is a privileged action. Uh, and you guys, I mean, we can continue asking questions. I got some more stuff, I think. Okay, yeah, I am talking about plugin abuses. Um, I was, this is the time that I was like, if you guys want to keep looking at, I think I've only got 15 minutes left though. Is that right? 15 minutes or so? Yeah. Yeah, all right. So I mean, if you guys want to keep looking at it, looking at the code base, I'm gonna talk about plugin author ownership, because that's a, an important one. Uh, also, when you include third-party libraries in your code, you are responsible for the third-party libraries too. Uh, a lot of people will forget, this is kind of what happened with Tim Thumb. It wasn't, the Tim Thumb wasn't the theme name, that was a library they included in a bunch of themes. It's a bunch of random themes, and the library never got updated. And it just got age and archaic, and then there was a vulnerability in the library, and nobody ever updated that, and there the vulnerability was the unauthenticated, unauthenticated upload, and then there was no maintenance on a section of code, which you think, and if you include the library, it's not your responsibility, right? Somebody else updates that code. But you need to update the updates in your code, too. So, and especially JavaScript libraries. Don't think that JavaScript libraries are immune to vulnerabilities. They also have tons. Um, uh, talking about plugin abuses real quick, for every plugin author here, um, like I said, we're the trusted source of code for sites that are installing on you. That's actually a, a, it's a really awesome thing people do, that they write code for free in the WordPress.org repo, and give it to the WordPress.org repo, and give it to everybody else who uses the WordPress, and it ex extends the, the, the the usage of WordPress, right? WordPress core is not that awesome when you compare it to all the hundreds of thousands of plugins. I don't know how many are in there, but it's a lot of plugins in there. It could be a full featured system. You as plugin authors have a huge responsibility to maintain your code, be trusted, and to, to, to accept the trust that the WordPress community has in you to give good code. And that's just me saying it's, it's really important what you're doing. It's good. There's been a problem in the last year this is a, a thing where somebody who wrote free code submitted it to the plugin repo, might have a few thousand installs, 5,000, 20,000 installs. It's really nice, right? But maybe they moved on in their life. Maybe it was something they wrote in college and they don't care about it anymore. And they get this email out of the blue saying, hey, I'd love to take over your plugin. Here, here's like an offer of $1,000 US. And that seems nice, right? Who would, who would take up that offer? Somebody offered you money for some plugin that you stopped developing like five years ago. Free money, right? This has been a problem, though. This is a scam. Uh, they offer a few hundred US, maybe thousand plus US, and they take over your plugin and they push out an update, and that update is a backdoor. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Everybody that, who has a plugin installed now gets an auto update, which includes a backdoor. It's a, the easiest way. It's expensive, but the easiest way to, to infect a bunch of sites. Uh, it's definitely been a thing. So you, as plugin authors, I please request that when you get that weird random email for somebody to buy your plugin, don't think it's just a free ride. And it's not free lunch, it's, it's a bit of a problem. Uh, and so that's what, coming back to the point of what do you do, how do you, how do you deal with taking over a plugin, or how do you deal with that? The plugins team can help change off who the author is for a plugin. But always be mindful that they're also worried about this. They're super worried about this, uh, because it's, that's a horrible thing, and they have to protect against it, and it's hard for them to protect against it. So the things you wanna do if you did um, 
have have to transfer ownership of plugins, don't definitely don't just take over the author's account. That's really that's really bad. That's the worst. That's what they do in this scam is they try to take over your whole account. So it's the same plugin author just updating it. it as but what the plugin team can allow you to do, it's a bit of work for them, and they're not paid <laughs> to do this. So don't don't like go there all the time. But they can change authors, and you can you can get somebody else to take over the thing. And the way in this case, if you had an old plugin, like you mentioned, the adopt, you can adopt plugins. So if you want to take over a plugin, if it has a little adopt me tag. That means it's open for somebody to take it over and be good. And the same thing in reverse. If you're not using the plugin, you don't want to update it anymore, and maybe you want to see if somebody's interested in it, you can add that tag to the plugin page, and people will know that they can take over and work on it from there. Uh, but again, it's a trusted position you are in because you are able to push code to sites all over the world. Now, you're, the code you write can be on any site in the world that runs WordPress. So it's, again, be respectful of that trust. Uh, handling security reports. Again, so a lot of trust. You're the steward for your code. You're the person who should be doing the verse, uh, the, the best thing possible. And you've done all the work as a plugin author to write good code. But some getting a security work, report can be kind of scary. And some people take offense when I've written them about security vulnerabilities because tone doesn't doesn't work over email. And it really, they assume the worst tone when I say, hey, I found this vulnerability in your plugin. To me, I'm very happy. It's all love. I'm like, hey, I found this vulnerability in your plugin. Check out how it works. Here's you're like doing uploads now, and, and I've got responses of like, who are you? Why are you telling me this? Because they think, they think what I said was, hey, found a vulnerability in a plugin. This is how it works. Here's all the problems in your code. They think that's what I'm saying. The reality is I'm, I'm a happy guy. <laughs> and I'm like, everything is fine. It just, here's the patch. And some people argue with me what the best patch is. And I'm like, I don't care, but that's just weird you're doing it that way. And like, you're gonna, like, but it's your code. You've done all the work. Treat a reported a security vulnerability report as in free work. Treat it just like a pull request. But I also, as a security vulnerability uh, researcher, I can't I can't do a pull request that includes a vulnerability in it because that also looks really bad because maybe you won't see the pull request. I'm like, I fixed this uh, terrible vulnerability in your code. Here's the example, which also shows that anybody who wanted to be malicious exactly able to attack. It's exactly what I showed here. It shows you the diff to say this is the problem. So normally they have to come in over email. So make sure you have a contact address. If you, you're a plugin author, have some sort of way to contact you. You can contact via the support forums, but that's public, so that's also weird. Again, it's not good for me to point out, or a security person to point out a vulnerability publicly. So we try to keep it nice under, under wraps and just discuss it and say, here's what I found, here's how to fix it. And uh, again, what is, what is my mantra? What is the mantra of security? Um, yeah, Santa, yeah, perfect. It's all you needed to take away from this, and that's all I've been saying for the last hour and a half. Um, sanitize escape, validate permissions, be mindful that you're res you are the person responsible for code and this code can be on any, they, your code, your plugin might end up on, I don't know, some major website. I think the US president uses WordPress, right? I know Obama did, right? The White House. The White House, yes, they use Word, your code might end up on the White House. So be, be mindful of that respect that you get. Um, this is my recommended readings, and we're pretty much kept wrapping up. I think I, I did decent on the time. You guys got five minutes, and I'll just hang out and chat, and you guys can, you can look at code. The one I highly recommend is the, these are just nice reading. This is the Building Secure Software. It is the book that I read when I was 16 years old, and it is all about writing exploit, well, preventing exploits in, in C and socket layer stuff, and, uh, and guess what the, guess what the, where I got my mantra from? This book, the entire thing I write when I was 16 years old, I read this whole thing, I'm gonna like figure out how all these vulnerabilities work, and then in the end I'm like, oh, it's just user inputs. Don't trust user inputs. Never trust user inputs. And that's, that's the whole book. I just wasted their, their money because nobody's gonna buy the book, because that's all I have to do is. Uh, Tangled Web is a great source, and No Search Press makes a lot of great uh, how-to books for stuff. Tangled Web is a great one that is a, a, a web app, well, not, it's not really a web app, but he's a vulnerability of security researcher, and he just did, a great list about how he finds vulnerabilities, his interactions with companies like Microsoft and stuff. It's kind of a more of a autobiography. But right here, the Plugin Developer Handbook is a great resource. That is what I have up right here. Read this as well. Understand nonces and security inputs and outputs and validation and user capabilities. That is going to make your plugin a thousand times more secure if there was a. And the OWASP is a great thing. There's WP Bowling DB is where I got all these vulnerabilities. 
so you guys can take do if you had fun a little bit of fun or wanted to see to find your own vulnerabilities use WP vulnerability you'll see how the all the vulnerabilities work uh, well all the vulnerabilities that get reported and now I also have to ask did anybody actually find any vulnerabilities we found some close ones didn't we so I have to find the VC right the um, unserialized vulnerability I found it like right off the bat it wasn't yeah it was Sabi the BB migrate so so we have to go find those those guys and show them in person that I'm only full of love when I point out this line of code. Um, any other questions from anybody? Yes? Yeah, I just want to point out one point because there's this really nice tool, a PHP called Simper, and uh, you can actually install the WordPress standards with it. Nice. And, uh, actually, it checks for all the things that you want to use. Yes, uh, so that is, that is, PHP code, PHP code Sniffer, another utility would be, is that paid or is free? It's free. That's and awesome. The WordPress standards are free as well. And for example, if you collaborate with WordPress VIP uh, with a hosting platform and stuff, they will would actually they can do audits for you. Yeah. There's another product out. It's called Rips R I P S. Uh, Rips Tech makes it. It's it, that's the one I knew of. Unfortunately, I didn't want to recommend it because it's paid. So I didn't want to be like, hey guys, buy this product. Like I'm not here, you know, <laughs> trying to Rips R I P S. I don't know. What I think it's. Something. And they also, there's a big problem. So what that is, is that is dynamic code analysis. So they're able to load WordPress and see, have in introspection on all of the objects and, and how PHP is breaking itself out. And then they can start hitting those objects with, with most common attacks to see if the output from PHP includes the expected uh, um, uh, string. So if you are able to like work on it at that level, it's probably it's what dynamic code analysis does. You, you load it in and you can inject what looks like an SQL you see a bit of code that looks like an SQL query, and then you see if the input from that, if you can mangle it to see if the output completes as a, a SQL injection <coughs> or things like that. What we did here was static code analysis. It's very slow to hit and miss sometimes. Uh, but yeah, using PHP sniffer. Codes. PHP, PHP codes. code sniffer. PHP CS. I'm just going to put that up big. Do I better? Yes. PHP code. Oh, I didn't work. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, Rips Tech and you said the other one? Uh, no, this doesn't work. But PHP code sniffer, Rips. Rips, or it might be Rips Tech. I think Rips Tech is the company. Both of these things, the biggest thing that's important on those is that they need to adhere and understand WordPress, which is something that Rips didn't use to do. And it made it basically useless because WordPress is a very complex uh, background. That's kind of what the guy did in, when I mentioned DEF CON. He thought he found thousands of vulnerabilities. And the reality is he didn't understand WordPress. WordPress had its own built-in checks and, and clean, cleanups for it. So that's basically a thing. So both of these, these are dynamic code analysis tools. Also good, but I will be checking out Code Sniffer because I want I want a free one myself. I don't like I don't get paid enough to to pay for these. They're they're pricey. A little bit pricey. It's because the intended audience for this is somebody who's a pen tester who you can pay and then you, they pay them thousands of dollars. So they can pay thousands of dollars for code once and then and then get charge other people as they do code audits uh, constantly. Uh, any other final? I think I'm done. Two minutes. So final questions. I'll also be at the, probably the bar of the Crown Plaza. I, no, no, no. As in a real bar. <laughs> If you find me around and see me around and you want to yell at me or, or make me look at your code, speedy guard. I hope I don't have to email you the next week. <laughs> and I'll check it out for you. Also, I brought stickers and shirts. Unfortunately, the shirts are only small. Who wants a small size shirt? <laughs> hey, I'm not going to throw. But stickers, if anybody wants. And as long as I got my USB things back. Can I have my USB things? Thank you. Thank you.